and welcome, welcome everybody to episode nine of law.mit.edu's idea flow, where we talk to thought leaders and doers and movers and shakers from around the world to talk with us about the growing edge of computational law. And I have to just say on a personal note, I couldn't be more thrilled with, um, with our guest today, someone who I've known for a few years and have had a close eye on as a source of key innovation in the area of computational law, but most especially at, at the cutting edge of blockchain and digital negotiations. And I'm speaking none other uh, speaking of none other than Olga V. Mack, CEO of Parley Pro, as well as a fellow of the College of Law Practice Management, also affiliated with Stanford and many accolades. And what we're going to talk about today is, is how the legal community is ready for purpose-built technology that supports and also memorializes contract negotiations and analyzes contract data. So I want to pose this organizing question. What if, what if such technology worked like a powerful microscope that would allow you to zoom in and pan around uh, and, and out of contracts and, and be, to be able to understand them and to assess their vitals is how Olga puts it. Um, what if indeed, we, we think digitizing contract negotiations will increase uh, your ability to make fact-based decisions and answer some of the perennial questions that legal departments are always posing. And we're going to go over some of those questions now and also see a really cool demo uh, that Olga has put together from her company. Uh, and I wanted to just say one thing by way of uh, like the customary MIT disclaimer, uh, which is, of course, MIT does not um, endorse any particular product or company or technology. Uh, but we are we, we did invite a demo um, of of this um, of this tool today because um, we, Olga and and our team felt that this was a very provided a very good and clear explanation of an example of the topic uh, before us today. And so with that, um, Olga. Oh, I'm sorry. And also, we'll be joined by discussant uh, our who you all know, uh, Megan Ma, who is pretty deep into this area and is going to help us kind of lead the conversation um, component of, of this episode. But without further ado, uh, Olga, I invite you to, there you go, come off mute. And if you'd be so kind as to maybe introduce yourself in your own words and, and, and explain to us what, are, what, are, what is the, the promise and the prospects of digital negotiation and contracts? Thank you, Daza. It's great to be here. It's good to meet everyone. And thank you, Megan, uh, for all your guidance uh, on this journey. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and um, I am very much excited about the, the future of, of law, the future of contract, and yeah, digital negotiation. Um, I, I'll kick out the, uh, the conversation by you know, talking about myself a little. I will alleviate Daza from uh, uh, trying to explain who I am. Uh, and, and then, you know, not get it exactly right. So I, the one story I know for sure is the one story of how I came to be here. So I'll tell that story too. Um, today, I'm building the future of law, uh, specifically the future of contracts. I'm the CEO of Farley Pro. I've been on my job for about two years. I uh, joined the company when the company has built a big chunk of the product. Um, and uh, I, I joined and uh, we went to market with that technology. We're easy to use, highly collaborative, uh, data-driven contract lifecycle management platform uh, that has pioneered digital negotiation. Uh, so um, that's, that's who we are and, and what I'm doing today. Um, I've been in law for quite some time now. I am what you would describe a tech lawyer by design. I went to law school uh, after I immigrated to the United States when I was 12 to Silicon Valley, San Francisco um, area and saw technology change my life, my family's lives and um, the life of my community. Um, and I wanted to be um, part of that. Um, and what that meant to me uh, is uh, intellectual property, security and privacy. And I spent some time at Wilson City as a litigator on that side. And at some point, I spent most of my career in-house. Uh, so I am probably corporate lawyer first. 
uh, have been at big companies called Visa Inc. Uh, for some time. And then at some point I ran away with startup service um, and have been now at multiple startups in various corporate legal roles and business roles. Uh, have been a number two lawyer, a dating company trying to take it public. I've been a number one lawyer at a, a sales engagement platform, general counsel, uh, and I sold that company. And then I was also VP of strategy of a blockchain company called Quantstem. Um, ha had an opportunity to build protocols, products, and partnerships, and uh, assisted with uh, various regulatory adventures with some of the most powerful regulators in the United States. So that's who I am and, 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 and uh, why am I here? Um, the short version of it is there are very few things in house that I haven't done. Um, and uh, I, I see that uh, corporate lawyers are on the cutting edge of, of, of changing our relationship with law. And I'm really excited uh, to, um, to, to be at Parley Pro and building it. Um, you know, uh, I, I never thought uh, I, I, when I was practicing law, I, I'm actually, I was a very happy lawyer. I never thought I would leave the practice of law. It just ha kept happening to me. Um, it's, um, and, um, I left the practice after 15 years. Very few people do that after they become general counsel and practice for 15 years. Um, and, and the reason for that is because I, you know, I spent a, a big chunk of my career sort of writing about the future of law, helping in-house lawyers to, to, to cross the bridge of digital transformation together. Um, and um, at some point I decided maybe I should stop talking and actually start building. Um, and, and, and so that, that's, that, that's the journey I have been uh, on. Uh, let's talk about negotiations uh, because um, I think it's a very exciting uh, thing. Um, contract uh, is a very um, rich place today of activity. Um, I specifically want to talk about negotiations because I think that's a very important, a highly underappreciated under -appreciated and complex area. Um, and one thing I know for sure as, as a lawyer and as a technologist is that negotiation is not just important um, because that's how you get to the deal, but it's important for the business for two reasons. One is that it's a sort of a process of learning. Um, you, when in interacting with the other side, yes, you talk about legal mumbo jumbo, but you actually talk a lot about each other. Um, it is a form of dating, <laughs> um, and you you really kind of get to know each other and what each other is made of and how things work and how things get approved and how stuff gets done and how long it takes and what is a definite no and what's a maybe and how you push for it. So it's a process of learning. It's a very, very important process. Um, and the second thing, it's also a process of operationalizing the contract. So you really get to, you get the chance to ask questions. Okay, well, we, you are committed to do certain things. What does it mean? How are you actually going to do it? Um, what are the steps? So it's, it's, it's a process of learning and all of that happens sort of in emails, calls, chats, conversations, and all of it when the contract is signed is lost. <laughs> It's like as if it never happened. Um, it, is, it, is, it, it is sort of at best chopped up and exists in various kind of emails and, and, and various places. Um, it is not collected, it is not aggregated, it is not studied. And when the contract goes to the business unit, new set of people who may or may not have history about what, what has been discussed negotiation look at the contract with newborn eyes. <laughs> and wondering what, what the heck it means. And thereby, as a lawyer, you start a new journey of entertaining every new person who asks you about provisions, partially because when they read it, they don't understand, and partially they have no history or, or context um, about what has happened. Um, and so, so that, that, is, that is really a big challenge and, uh, and really, uh, throwing away negotiation data um, is, is, is sort of throwing away the most important thing on some level, um, you know, because in the end, the point of contract is not to get a piece of paper. The point of contract is to um, get on the same page and continue forward. Um, and so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, before I kind of talk a, a little bit more how we think about this, negotiation data, let me kind of start with a few basics. 
um, you know, I tend to think of contracts as sort of a bouquet of, of, of clauses. A uh, normal contract, you know, has 15 to 22 or so clauses. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of redundancies. Um, they have specific attributes. So, you know, certain clauses tend to have certain attributes. You know, your jurisdiction will have geographical location and your limit of liability will have dollar amounts and uh, various dates obligations and stuff like that. Um, they also have sort of association with who acted. For example, somebody edited, somebody reviewed, somebody responded, somebody approved. So you have a lot of action going on in the negotiation. Um, and those actions can be done by people and they're increasingly done by automated processes. Uh, so there's sort of a lot of parameters. So when I refer to negotiation data, um, you know, what I include is sort of clauses, attributes, plus data relating to such as who reviewed, why they made decision, who made suggestions, how the language evolved, what has been learned in the process, um, how long it took, uh, how things were prioritized, deprioritized, sort of lots of data, um, much of it can be important over time uh, to the actual performance of the contract. Um, and at a high level, if you're thinking about sort of digitizing negotiations, there's always gonna be sort of this process of initiating requests, identifying specific attributes, identifying actions, people, automated processes, and then sort of automating clause review, let's say redlining, but there may be another way to respond to, to changes, and then eventually assembling the final contract. So those are kind of low, you know, high level steps of digital contract negotiation. Um, and what's important to note is that in the process of digital negotiation, there are simultaneous two conversations. There are sort of internal conversations and external conversations from each side's point of view. And in both cases, a lot of data is created and, and should be collected. So on the internal side, people sort of figuring out their positioning, uh, how decisions are made, who, uh, you know, what risks they're taking. And depending on the industry that may or may, may need to be documented and kept sort of auditable trail off. Um, and then on the external side, you are essentially huggling one way or another and figuring out uh, how things gonna work. Um, and what I mean by digital negotiation is that these conversations are happening in one place at the same time. And, and the system essentially uh, taking record of all of those side by side conversations, attributes, people, places, perhaps even multiple documents. Um, and so uh, when you uh, get a, a negotiated contract at the end, it is not a flat document. It is not sort of this one, one dimensional uh, final result with the signature at the bottom. It's more like a file. It has connections to people, places, various decisions, other papers, um, other, uh, other uh, contracts and stuff like that. And that's an important thing. Um, and and that, that's the data that one needs to be collected, systematized, and then eventually what needs to happen to that negotiation data, it needs to be connected to the actual performance of the contract. Because today we're treating contracts as if the, the life of a contract ends during negotiation. Okay, we have this beautiful piece of paper, great, we're done. Um, but the reality is the, the point of the contract is not to have a contract. The point of the contract is to have an impact with whatever instrument you are negotiating, whether it's you know money or some outcome. Um, and so- Can I, can I uh, Bodensky for one second? Because uh, yes. there's a, uh, well, one thing I want to just also say, first say is like we, want to spend most of the time if possible on discussion and idea flow um but but i do want to interrupt you at this midpoint in your presentation to say something that i know is going on in people's minds that i hope that you'll speak to um now or at some point before you're done with your remarks is um the, the, the traditional lawyering is emphasizes uh the or the contract and evidence rule a lot of the the, the parole evidence rule or the so-called four corners of the contract where the, the psychology and the almost dogma 
I would say at this point behind that is that the only enforceable terms of a of a contract are in the four corners of that inert, you know, contract itself, uh, and that whatever the negotiations were leading up to it, or you know, other communications are. Um, to the extent that they, you know, contradict or change the terms of just what's in that contract, they are inadmissible. Uh, that's the parole evidence rule in U.S. law, at least. And so I just wanted to ask if you could speak at some point to how to, well, um, how to um, harmonize uh, the important insights you're bringing about the depth of knowledge and value that we get from remembering negotiation to this idea that the contract itself is not the authoritative source of rules governing the party's uh, rights and obligations and relationships and interactions. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I will, I guess, maybe insert some drama into this conversation um, and, um, and say that, look, we create contract with an eye that they one day will have an opportunity to shine in courts. Uh, there will be a sword and a shield, and we will have the ultimate audience of a judge who will take our side. That sounds awesome, but it's not true. <laughs> the reality is majority of countries don't go to court, if I, um, and, 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 and really contracts, they're, all of them, one way or another, are used to run day-to-day -day business, and that's their value. Their value is not of the one person or even jury you know, however number of people you have in your jurisdiction um, to be the ultimate judge in, you know, and, and, and using it as a shield and, and a sword type of thing. The, the value of a contract and the reason they are business assets is not, it's not an insurance. There is a difference between insurance and a business asset. And I see contracts as, as a business asset and the data created during the process I'm not talking about disagreement. Uh, I said, you said, and the con final contract said something else. What did we mean? The uh, resolution. I'm talking about all this other information uh, that I can use in my business. If I know, for example, that my supplier will be uh, taking uh, goods through China, and China, for some reason, for example, has a massive, uh, I don't know, uh, COVID type of situation or some other type of situation. Um, and that data may not be actually in my contract, but if I look through the negotiation data, we've had conversation, hey, what routes we take? Do you have alternative routes? That, that's usually normally discussed in the process of negotiation. Then I have extra insights that are not available on the four corners of the document that I can use and say, you know, this is not in our contract, perhaps something else changed in your business, but based on our conversation, I have a strong reason to believe that your supply chain goes through China. I have real concern because you have a national disaster. How can I support you to be a better partner for both of us so we can continue this relationship, right? So I'm not talking about disputes. I'm talking about everyday negotiations. I, what I'm talking about is you know, yes, final flood document is fantastic and perhaps maybe something you can use in court. Uh, chances of you having that opportunity are slim to none in my 15 year in-house legal career. I had not had an opportunity to litigate my contract or frankly anyone else's contract that was my predecessor. Um, so uh, it's, it's highly unusual. Yes, some contracts have risen to disputes and threats, uh, but ultimately, you know, I did my job well. We didn't end up in court, uh, if I can give myself a backhanded compliment, so to speak. So yes, I think we need yes. to reframe from, um, you know, the, the reason why we, we contract in the first place. And I think that mind shift is actually very important. And once you free yourself of a prison of, of writing toward the eye um, and creating toward the eye of the court only, once you realize you have many audiences um, and then different parts of the contract is important, um, then you start looking for ways to actually optimize every experience and it, relationship you have with the contract to to move your business forward. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry. I, I know it's 1223 now. And so I didn't want to derail us, but I know that that was a question on some people's minds. And no, no, no. That's a, that's a great question. Let me actually finish with I, my remarks because I'm almost done. 
um, yep. the, uh, the, the one thing to keep in mind is that the, the beautiful thing about, you know, data is that you can, uh, you know, answer simple questions. And those simple questions end up being very key in your business. You can answer simple questions as what's in your contract and why it's there. Those are sort of, I think, table stake questions. Um, and today in most businesses, those questions cannot be answered. That is what lawyers do all day, every day, answering table stakes, silly questions that should be answered easily, automatically, depending on your role in the organization. Uh, but more importantly, we can do even more, we can have even more fun with that negotiation data. We can do things like predicting future, you know, it's like one of the better crystal balls you can have. So um, that's one thing. And then ultimately what you can do with negotiation data is answer what I think is the most important question in the context of the business is what can I do today to make my future brighter tomorrow? Uh, because the, the thing about data is that you can run correlations and you will find that simple things make huge difference and you can tweak your behavior and you can, that will have huge results, however you define the impact. So that's ultimately kind of what it is, what is the kind of parts of it uh, and, and why to do it, what's in it for you. Uh, that's, I'll stop talking, I know I talk too much. <laughs> happy to show a demo, happy to answer questions. Yeah, well, I think that, so thank you so much for that. that. There was a lot in there. I am so glad that we were recording this um, because uh, there's a, there's a lot of substance behind your uh, your very few words. Uh, I wanted before you show your demo, maybe we just use this escape valve moment to pull the room and in chat. Does anybody that's in our live studio audience or virtual studio have any like urgent clarifying questions or or anything at this point before we see the demo? That's a high buy. Urgent, you know, reasonable is good. They don't have uh, to be urgent. <laughs> That's the way I'm doing it. Uh, okay, seeing none, um, then let's see the demo and then let's get into all reasonable and unreasonable questions <laughs> after the demo. Um, it's all on the table. So yeah, let, please do show us, uh, Olga, like an example of these uh, rather um, rather pr uh, provocative and profound um, sources of value that you were just outlining verbally. Yeah, I will show one implementation of, of digital negotiation in Parler Pro. I, I actually think there's many ways to, to do this. Um, and uh, I do think that we're going to see even more ways as we go forward. This, this, is, this is something that I think will evolve over time. So definitely not the only way, uh, but one way that, um, that I, I think is a good way to do it. Um, by the way, I've never shared the video in my entire life in Zoom. So let's do this. Can everybody see uh, the player? Yep, Before we've got good, good video. This video illustrates digital negotiation in Parley Pro using the uploaded third-party manufacturing agreement. Once the contract is created in Parley Pro, the contract is automatically subdivided into clauses. This enables you to redline contracts, communicate, and collect data at the clause level. And yes, just like in Microsoft Word, you can redline your contract. You have the choice of how to communicate changes. You can select an internal communication mode. And if you select this mode, only the members of your team will be able to see this red line. Under no circumstances, the counterparty will be seeing it. Alternatively, you can share the red line with the counterparty. Once you post it, the counterparty will be invited to the Parley Pro platform to see this shared red line. If you don't want to send red lines to the counterparty one by one, for example, because you want to review the entire contract, you can queue up your external posts. When you're ready, with a single click, you will release all red lines to the counterparty. Again, if you decide to select internal and post, only internal team will be able to see it. You can also see the entire history of a particular clause. For example, you can see the original text. You can see tags proposed by Lillian with a timestamp and with a clear indication that it is internal and only your team can see it. Because of the modular approach to the contract, you can also invite your end users to the specific clause in the contract. For example, you can invite Greta and ask her to review and advise. And once posted, Greta will review the notification with a secure link to exact place in the contract, which enables her to reply quickly. Parley Pro will capture her response in real time. Modular approach to contracts during digital negotiation enables you to quickly bring fallback positions. 
For example, for payment, you can click on payment to see three pre-approved positions and share externally. Now the counterparty is invited to work side by side with you on this contract. As you can see, real-time internal and external collaboration is a key to the efficient work with contracts. They also enable you to collect a lot of data about clauses, contracts, and contract portfolio. They provide real-time visibility and transparency to your end users. A detailed history of negotiation in the discussion board allows you to see all open or all previously opened red lines. You can preview the red lines and see what's going on there. You can also act and counter here. For example, change to the 25th and you can post it and so on. Or you can jump to the contract to see this change in the actual contract. This way, your contract is more like a file. They are three-dimensional assets that contain all interactions. You see connections to people, places, workflows, and other documents. Everything in one place. Data is collected throughout negotiation in real time and is available in the interactive dashboards. So you can see how many discussions are pending for your team and counterparty, how non-standard clauses are negotiated, and much, much more. In sum, real time visibility and transparency available through digital negotiation in Carly Pro. They improve productivity, bring value to your organization, and change your relationship with the contract. Okay. Um, so that, that was a, a quick uh, show of implementation of Carly Pro. Uh, that's, I'll let you uh, channel questions um, and uh, have a discussion. Outstanding. Thank you so much for sharing, for setting up the, the general concept, which is, I think, going to be somewhat new to, to some of us, at least, uh, and then showing a real applied example in your company of, of, of how it can look when you package it as a, as a product. Um, and so I'll, I'll get us. So number one, uh, as Olga said, um, this is the time. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, and best yet, if you have ideas, um, bring them forward by raising your hand and or um, typing them into the chat and we'll, uh, Megan and I will get a cue going and we want to hear from you. We know you. Uh, we know you have ideas. Um, you are our, our people. Um, and so uh, bring them now. Um, I'll get us started by just asking a high level question. So I'll start with the observation that this is a little bit new. It, it shouldn't be new. It's so much common sense behind what you're saying. You, you'd think it would be um, traditional practice to gather all this information and have it at our fingertips and be able to use it as part of the um, kind of portfolio of knowledge that, that um, should accompany all key relationships in business and arguably in life. Um, and yet it's not representative. As you say, the information is almost always lost. Um, to to um, the organization and even to the people that negotiated it after the deal is done. Um, they may not be able to find the whole chain of things. And so I wanted to ask in, in the context of, so with technology, it, it, it seems like you're really onto something, like you've, you've found some of the magic uh, quadrant area for, for the types of capabilities and functions that can, that can help uh, collect and make render usable some of this information from the negotiation phase. I'm wondering now about the business and almost the social um, dimension of change, because people have one way of behaving now, and this is a little bit of a different way of behaving and of conducting, um, of, of collecting and using data and understanding and conducting themselves with business relationships. Like, what's, what, what's the theory of change, I guess I'd say, and if there's organizations that maybe hadn't looked at this before and they want to, and you would like to have a conversation with them to consider um, adopting and, and applying and uh, adapting these processes for their salespeople and their business relationship managers and the rest of their business, like, well, what, how, how would this, what, what are the, um, I guess, what are the um, drivers and inhibitors to to this at a social level. Uh, what are the um, problems and prospects for this type of change in behavior? Um, you know, I guess what stops law to be in twenty first century? That's such a great question. It's almost easier to answer what doesn't. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I guess maybe I'll talk about two things that I think um, are prevalent 
by no no way the only things the things that i i kind of see one is the this normalization of discarding negotiation data as for you know for partially because you know of the four corners documents and parole rule and that that type of stuff partially because we've always done it this way you know when i became the general counsel first um there was a, a leader there before i joined um, and i inherited this leader's uh, slack uh inbox and folders digital folders i not not paper folders thank god um i never had paper folders in my my entire life um and you will not believe how many times i was asking myself what the hell was dan thinking that was like a number one question i asked myself for three years every time somebody had a question why we had certain results how stupid conclusions were made you know i I feel I've never met Dan, but I feel like I know Dan. I read his inbox. I read his comments. I, you know, Dan and I could be best friends. Like I really see this person, and I did it by searching and and uh, repiecing, you know, his reality a few years before I joined. There's an easier way to to do this. I didn't have to do that yet. It's like a totally normal exercise of excavation. And um, and and every 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 council general or not or more junior does this day after day. We do this. So we consider it normal. We don't question it, you know. And then we wonder why we hate our jobs. That's why we hate our jobs because we're ninjas forced to do little things that that could be done by by machines in better ways. Um, I think that's that's a, that's a big chunk of it. Um, and then uh, sort of. In addition to what the heck was Dan thinking, um, is that you know digital negotiation is much more fun when it's automated with AI and all of that. That requires sets of data, uh, contracts are proprietary documents. Uh, lawyers are not into oversharing <laughs> and 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 their data. Um, and the thing is, the data set improves as the size gets larger. So there's this practical challenge with with data. That it's proprietary and, and getting to it is, is a little hard. Those are kind of the top two things that I think are challenges. There's a good deal in others. And I actually would love for the folks here on the call, um, you know, this is much more fun if we do it together. I can talk all day, but if you can contribute, this is we can actually have fun together. Um, well, good news. We we have someone in this specific named role uh, of, of what we call discussant. Um, and what they do is they're a knowledgeable person that everyone trusts and loves to start with. Um, who can actually get us into the discussion and get get the juices flowing so everyone can be um, you know, can start to contribute. And she is none other than Megan Ma, um, who I think we, who you and I both know and work with Olga, because now in addition to being one of our uh, chief editors at the um, MIT Computational Law Report, of which this Idea Flow um, series is a um, is one of our productions, but she's also now at Stanford's Codex, where where you share some lineage uh, together, and so the perfect bridge builder. And so, uh, Megan, I know that you have something to contribute because you told me so in chat, and uh, <laughs> so you got the floor. Yeah, thanks so much. And first of all, I've got to say, Olga, this is so impressive. And of course, everything that you do is like the Midas touch. It is fantastic, um, and this is really really cutting edge. And part of what makes it really exciting is the fact that, and Des alluded to this, it seems kind of obvious that this should exist already. Um, and it's just amazing that sometimes actually things that should be the most intuitive, you have really powerfully brought it to people's eyes. Um, so congratulations again on that. And seeing actually your user interface is spectacular. It's just so simple and, simple but powerful at the same time. So again, incredible. Um, part of what excites me and some of my research is looking into formalizing the context. And what you're really showing here is actually how powerful it is to reveal what that context is. Um, Desa pointed and you had elaborated on the fact that it seems that we like to memorialize just legal documents, that things begin and end with just these pieces of paper and text, um, but really there's a lot that surrounds it. Um, I think sometimes there's 
this interesting analogy um, that in the UK, they have something called the Hansard, which is the parliamentary debates that are kind of publicized. And what's interesting about this is that this is somewhat like negotiations behind um, the legislation because you're sort of bringing to light this debate. But one thing about it is that you can't hold it in court. So if there is an issue associated with statutory interpretation, um, you can't actually refer to Hansard or in the case it was very, very rare. And I wonder at times kind of with these negotiations and with the power of digital negotiations and having this data, would you think that we kind of move into this paradigm shift that you're talking about that we could hold people more accountable um, with this type of data? The other side of it that I'm wondering at least is you're really actually to the heart of it returning party autonomy and the meeting of the minds and this kind of fundamental contracts doctrine. But it seems that, again, people still use contracts and that sole legal document, as opposed to this network, as kind of the sword and shield that you're talking about. So going back to, again, my question, do you think that will transition with kind of proliferation or you know, further development in negotiations? Will there be this paradigm shift in kind of what you can bring to court um, and what holds? You know, look, if you talk to any business professional, they will tell you that the one thing that matters, like all this like legal would do is great, uh, but what really matters is relationship at the end of the day. And uh, negotiation is also in addition to operationalizing and, and learning is also a relationship building. Um, and, and we can't, you know, it, the, even though that lawyers are really good guardians of legal documents, I don't know if I'm going to be controversial, but I'm going to just say it. Lawyers are not the owners of legal documents. They belong, they're assets that belong to the organization, whatever that may be, nonprofit, for profit, government, whatever. You're just an excellent guardian <laughs> as a lawyer, you're not the owner. And uh, the business pressures of relationship building, learning, data driven are so high that this, this argument of, hey, we need a sword and a shield, it, it's an emperor with no clothes because the question is here at some point, business will ask, what are the chances of that happening? And if the chances of that happening approach is zero, then maybe your priorities are not straight. And because a modern business businesses are so data driven and so optimized. And I, I, you know, if you look at contracts, you know, we spent in any given organization for the last 15, 20 years, we spent uh, so much time and resources to digitizing the front office and the back office. And what connects those two is a bicycle pass of data called contracts. What you need is industrial data bridge because contracts are replicated in every system throughout the organization, ERP, CRM, all of those systems. And you know, the number one thing I do as a, as a council one is telling people what's in their contract. Number two, reconciling what's in the contract versus in the system. That should be done automatically, supplemented by digital data, connected to performance of contracts, so that when I negotiate, a number one question people will ask me, what are the chances of this thing that you spent three months negotiating actually happening and how impactful it is? I can say, actually, never in the history of 100 years for this company. So maybe we should take a different approach. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there is, there is a, because the, the infrastructure has been built in the organization so much, the bicycle path of data is just not cutting it anymore. And the pressure is from the business itself. So I, I, I don't think it's sustainable. I, I think that will change. It's just the arch of change is definitely bending that way. Excellent. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so I want to highlight one thing just uh, to, for framing, and then we we finally do now have a queue of people that are ready to jump in. But the thing I want to highlight is the the context within which um, we're hearing this. So the context that many of us start with as soon as we hear the word law is litigation. Um, 
the, but the prevailing context here in terms of uh, where the value proposition is and where most of the um, most of the use cases, if you want to look at that, are is not litigation. It is run of the day, everyday relationships and business and conducting operations and processes in the ordinary course. Uh, and, and and where's the value uh, from this information for those purposes? Um, I think that's just very important. And the legal documents value in terms of a, a knowledge asset. Um, we, we've always believed at law.mit.edu is primarily not on the litigation path. It's primarily to support and reflect uh, the, the core um, uh, goals and objectives of, of, the, of the parties to the legal rules or instruments, um, but um, not but never think about the litigation path. Like that's there, but that's not the primary uh, uh, potential for value or the prevailing context even uh, for the information. So I just want to kind of spotlight this, something that Olga said several times, but I think it, you can't say it enough because we're all indoctrinated in law school uh, with case law as though that that's, that's the main context. And of course, it, a lot of things must have gone very wrong to get to that context. And thank God it's very rare. Okay, uh, Her Honor, um, the right and uh, an honorable uh, judge, uh, Renato, is now does now have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Olga, so much for your presentation. I loved it so much, and I'm really excited about this because it actually brings the negotiation as a part of the contract and. Uh, Going pretty much on the same direction as Daza said before, I think that bringing this context to the life of the contract itself, uh, rather than uh, just paying attention to a document or to a piece of paper, uh, brings the day-to-day -day life of the business to uh, mediation or arbitration scenery. And we can actually start thinking about how we could integ integrate this with tools such as Clarus, for instance, because the jurors that are randomly randomly selected on a platform could actually uh, have a body of evidence that would be built amongst the part and maybe easily solve a dispute without without even needing to to reach a court or something like that and actually having an answer or a solution to a day-to-day -day event that could could actually bring to uh, the remains of the business because uh, no one, no, nobody wants the business to stop. Uh, and once we reach uh, for the in intentions of the part and to the good faith of the part, and that actually it, we can actually extract that from the neg negotiation levels of the contract, uh, we can actually think of keeping business running and on a larger context, on a mediation context, that's just very important. And no, I don't want any more lawsuits, especially in Brazil, because we've got like 77 million lawsuits and that's pretty much enough. <laughs> it, it's freeing not to, to operate from the place of being scared. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. And, and, and we can actually, uh, evaluate the good faith of the parties once we reach the levels of negotiation negotiation that sometimes aren't a uh, part of a portfolio of knowledge as does a well put right i think does said that expression that's that was just amazing that was just great i get really excited when i get a good body of evidence but i don't but i just don't want, don't need any more lawsuits yeah. going on <laughs> yeah, just... yeah no i mean look i mean there is something real that it does create um there's a couple of things that happens in the process of digital negotiation it gives you an alternative way to solve challenges uh so if anything it sort of accomplishes the original purpose of the contract to to have clarity about disputes and and give you alternative routes and and uh, we now have an increasingly digital uh, dispute resolution platforms that are being built. So you can imagine that this data will flow there too. Um, it, it, and, you know, you brought up sort of, um, you and Daza and Megan brought up kind of this point of the opportunity cost point as well. Um, and, um, you know, today, you know, you kind of have, you know, first of all, you know, if you ever 
in-house doing contracts, you're basically having the same conversations with different strangers all day, every day, exactly in the same way. And you know, you like move an inch to the left, there's three possible responses. You move an inch to the right, there's five possible responses. And you like living this finite number of realities every day, all day, for years, you know, and trying to, and you know, I once I had this conversation with my manager, I was like, I'm, 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 I'm I, I, you know, this contract is the same. I can't negotiate this anymore. He's like, it's slightly different every time. I'm like, no, 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 it's the same. Um, you know, so, um, but one of the conversations you have is like, look, you're taking an unreasonable position and the other side will tell you, oh, it's reasonable to me. And, and you are just there pointing fingers at each other. What digital negotiation does is actually kind of gives you data baseline of normal behavior and where people end up. So instead of saying, no, you're crazy, no, no, you're crazy, no, no, no you're crazy. You can say, actually, your behavior deviates from the mean. Now you have data. <laughs> now you can call out the outlier behavior. And this behavior costs your, your company and my company money for every minute we haven't signed the contract. Do you still want to be that? <laughs> right? So it allows, so what I think practically speaking, it also will allow to, to, to have a standard of behavior that is normal. And I do think there will be a peer pressure in business as it is in business when you see an outlier who misbehaves, who treats people poorly, who wastes resources, who is not professional, who is bad faith, legally speaking, that behavior is quickly punished. Those are the people who are not promoted. Those people who don't have allies. Those people who are not building bridges. Those people who have a very short life in corporate world, right? Right now, it's really hard to call this out because you end up as the, you, in this conversation, you're crazy, no, no, you're crazy. And it's really hard to convince someone who is crazy. Uh, but if, on the other hand, you have data and this person is clearly deviating by magnitude, you can have your business people or you as a lawyer can have a conversation you know, how committed are you to be a good partner? And by taking this position that is measurable, I have real doubts in your ability to carry this partnership forward in the future. I think your conversations will change and, and they will be much more streamlined and much more standardized. And I think we could think as well as a, uh, maybe a standard of evidence. Yeah. You know, for uh, not only litigation, but as an entire body of conduct and having a standardization, you, you, you reach an objective level of truth inside of, uh, inside of negotiations uh, on a, during litigation and things like that. I mean. Yeah, it, it, will, it, it will reinforce another modern value of collaboration. You know, what has changed since many laws written and, and, and what kind of sets up the way we negotiate is that we are dealing in, we, the virtue of collaboration is much more prevalent today than the, the you know, the virtues of independence and, 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 and kind of not collaborating. And, and, and the modern contracting is not reflecting that, that importance of collaboration in the business world. Indeed. Okay, I'm going to thank you so much for, for those perspectives. Um, and so I, that made me think of another idea. Uh, so I'll throw it on the table, which is, uh, I was just reflecting back on, or I guess more than 20 years of, uh, of doing transaction networks in particular is a niche for me. Uh, so like supply chains, uh, payment, payment networks, uh, um, technology federations, like single sign-on federations across a big swath of the industry stuff like that. And so in that context, one thing that occurs to me is that you've got a lot of parties um, and they're all doing something sort of in concert. And it, in fact, is a contract system, like payment systems, like the visa is the visa operating rules and participation agreements, supply chains have the trading partner agreements and the umbrella. It's a contract system. Um, identity federations are, for, are all contract based systems, multilateral contracts for applying standards a certain way and allocating liability and business practices. So when I think about the, this sliver of the contract world, that's that's um, kind of large transactional systems that are uh, contract-based, multiplayer, 
it, one thing that occurs to me about them is that especially when I'm involved in like constructing them and, and, and papering them over and facilitating it is that a core part of the ongoing system that's reflected in the contract is gathering the um, data all, because it's high velocity and high volumes of data as you're going. Um, and that that's a major way to monitor the network, but also to identify where something's not working. There's maybe a lot of disputes or inefficiencies so that we can adapt the next version of the rules and the architecture of the network as we go. And it seems to me like there may be a particularly strong value proposition and uh, and also opportunities based on the existing guts of the, these multilateral tr high volume transaction systems uh, for applying some of the wisdom that you're describing, not just the, from the negotiation phase, although for sure the negotiation phase, but also the sort of, I'd almost call it the ongoing negotiation that happens from the version one of the contract all the way through the life cycle of this multiplayer system. Um, and- uh, Yeah, well, that, I, I, look, I work with Visa, so I can tell you, I was yeah. I'm the only lawyer for debit processing service, which is a global business, and you know, one thing you'll learn very quickly if you if you're part of that business is that like two or three random facts predict fraud with like almost absolute accuracy. You know, if like you know you buy a you know a, a hat from a convenience store, take out twenty dollars and do something else, like totally random facts that are, they predict fraud with absolute accuracy, and like you know, you need to stop the card. That, that, and that's what I meant with being able to uh, create a brighter future. There, there are little things that you do in your negotiation that I guarantee you that you don't even think about that make a difference between multi-billion dollar contract and the one that basically no one ever cares about. Um, and the only way you're going to get to that is through data. Just like Visa can predict fraud with accuracy, your bankruptcy with accuracy, all kinds of things with accuracy. <laughs> Um, that's what you ultimately, this is, you know, it's, today we're not even at stable stakes. We're not even, cannot even, we don't even know what the heck in the contract, let alone what happened in negotiation and why it's there and all of that. But the ultimate thing is to get to where credit cards are today is being able to take three random facts and say, if you tweak this a little, your future could be brighter <laughs> or less risky, whichever you prefer to do. Right. Um, and I think that's what Daza you're alluding to. Yeah, I think that's definitely that. a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. Yeah, exactly that. And, and that sort of brings to, so I'm going to try to now tie two of the themes from the conversation so far together and tell me how close I got, Olga. Uh, <laughs> but um, so the premise on the one hand is out wait, having not, or, or not related to litigation. Um, there's a tremendous um, vault of, of largely untapped business value from this data. Um, meanwhile, when we also look at like, well, high volume litigation, like from a judge, um, there's potential to take some of this data and actually break through the, in the maybe over, uh, overwrought, uh, fourth wall of, uh, of the parole evidence state of the parole evidence rule and actually use this to, um, handle some disputes based on, uh, demonstrated behavior, um, b below litigation, but in that process through mediation and other methods, arbitration and other things. Um, so the thing about visa, one of the many things about the visa operating regulations and participation agreements for the, you know, acquiring banks and, um, and uh, issuing banks and the transaction processes and cardholders is that how well it deals with the middle area of basically actually putting in the contract, having the contract say the source of data is going to be part of how we adjudicate who uh, bears the risk of loss in this. So like we actually can in contracts not change the parole evidence rule, but just add something to the contract that says the negotiation data shall be deemed, you know, one of the factors in determining X, Y, and Z or, or the performance data going forward shall, shall uh, be a uh, part of some contract process for, for example, adding new fraud rules or that sort of things. So like yeah. we can, we can resynthesize this by changing the contract, which of course is infinitely malleable because it's a contract. Yeah. And you can digitally change through negotiation. I think you're right. There is sort of, uh, there is sort of an operational value, you know, so you can actually continue building your business through challenges. And we discussed that there is sort of the opportunity to make a brighter future 
And there's, there's an opportunity to, to tie things to money and financial instrument. And the example I will give quickly to kind of paint what's possible. So we negotiate limit of liability. Often, you know, any, any, any lawyer in the room knows that this is a complicated discussion that tied to reps and warranties and limit of liability, depending on the size of contracts. We're talking like days, weeks, months, right? If we know that, you know, what is, if we can somehow tie this discussion to money, if we can somehow know what are the chances of this being triggered, how often that happens, what is the outcome, how many times, like if we can actually calculate the, the value, well, how do you normally deal with risk? Do you haggle? No, you buy insurance. You pay a dollar for a highly unlikely event and get a hundred if it happens. So one way we can do is we can negotiate limits of liability to no end and lose three months of revenue, or we can both pitch in $5, buy insurance and move forward with our life and automatically basically put provisions that Daza has described. So it allows to actually take parts of contract and link them to financial instruments and you know, uh, make the opportunity cost of negotiation, you know, that risk portion of it much more streamlined because today we don't, we don't we deal with, we have very sophisticated instruments in insurance to deal with it. And the only reason contracts are not linked to that is because they're like papers, whether they're sort of digital paper or actual paper, it almost doesn't matter. We treat them as if they're paper. We discard all the data. We cannot link them to a financial instrument to save our life. Um, and I know we're at time, so thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And thank you so much, Olga. Um, you know, it, 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 and the best idea flows when we get to the end of the hour, we're ready to begin. And I feel like we're ready to begin uh, to really delve into this with you now that we've set the stage. And I just want to say, I really, I don't think we've ever had a return guest on idea flow before, but I hope you'll be our first. Um, I hope you'll come back and, and let us advance this conversation with you. There's so much in what you said, and uh, we just we're, we couldn't be more grateful for your generous time and the preparation that you did with us and sharing your demo and starting to spark some of these critical ideas that are not so not, not just important for contracts, but I think really are essential for the entire the, the idea itself of computational law. So thank you, Olga. Um, we're very grateful. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here and happy to be back. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation.